everybody. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to the British Library food season and to Super Sunday, which uh, is the end of our Super Weekend of food season events. We had things all day yesterday, all day today, um, and I think some of you may have been with us all the way through, so a uh, huge thanks for that. And welcome to all of you and to everyone who's joining us online as well. This is our closing event of the food season Super Weekend. There's more events to come in the season, but not this weekend. We are signing off in the quite the best way possible. Um, I'm Angela Clutton, I am the co-director of the food season and I work with Polly Russell, who's the founder and curator, and Melissa Thompson and Joe Allen uh, and Emma Peddy. Um, and together we programme the season and this is one of the very first events which we planned. Um, and I'm gonna name check Jeremy Lee as being my, uh, I don't know what the word would be, my co-conspirator in planning this, possibly, um, and thinking about how we might put together this celebration of Fergus Henderson in the year that he turned 60, and thinking about all that has been achieved in his life and work and the impact and ongoing influence. It's so lovely to have so many of Fergus's friends and family here. We are enormously pleased that so many of you were able to make it. Um, we are having a conversation with nine people. As you can see, we have a lot of chairs here. Um, and that's because there are people from lots of different aspects of Fergus's work and life which are going to speak to what Fergus means to them. Uh, and so we're going to be hearing from a whole range of people, as you can see, as we go along. And our conversation is going to be led by Crispin Somerville. Before we get to that, though, we are going to have a very special 18 minutes watching a film called Fergus by T.J. Wilcox, which has been kindly um, arranged for us by Sadie Coles, and it is the most gorgeous film. Some of you may have seen it, I think. It's 18 minutes long, made in 2017, shot partly in London, partly in Tyree, partly with some family footage in there as well. And it is extraordinary, it's beautiful, and I think it's a lovely way for us to ease into the celebration of Fergus Henderson at 60. I really hope you enjoy it. My first evidence of being on the island was Cat in the Hat Dictionary. It says Fergus has a birthday, age four, Tyree. It says, it says potential, sense of potential, having Tyree. Why Tyree? Uh, um, it's hard to convince people. There's a grey, rainy, windy, blowy island. There's freezing sea, is a place that they would like to go every summer. But when they go, they understand. It's hard to put into words, so you can't really do it justice because it's such a magical sort of crazy spot blown by the wind. And you go native, feral, seaweed in your hair and sand in your pockets. It's just a magical, calm place. Yes, that's a place everyone falls in love with. And trees, it's interesting, no trees, it's the wind. Let's see, where's the mainland? You think trees? How oh, gauche. Which is a bit like having a bit of parsley. You just garnish on a plate. Unnecessary. And I can't think of anything better to inspire you how to place up food. There's an island that you just see rock. Sand and Macca. We cherish for that, and it's um, Get to my line that floats me. Hello, I'm Fergus Henderson. I'm part owner of St John Restaurant and I'm sort of all seeing chef there. Yes. I'm sure I'll describe it. Food is a very fickle thing. It becomes a trend. It's a we all get tired and bored of it. But it's it's common sense, which is rather sad. So rather dull. Nature writes amazing menu for you. Just pay attention. Shortly, game birds will begin. Nature hurls things down from the sky, saying, eat me. And that's sort of crazy, that we don't. 
messed up somewhere along the line. Parsons when it cut. I suppose this about 20 years ago now. I was 30, 30 something. I stayed there just as long as possible. But I was um, quite, I moved a lot. I had a tiny little kitchen. So I thought, but I had to, my sous chef, head chef. I stayed there for Hitchin, which was a sad moment. But now, um, this miracle operation wires in my brain, the battery. Pipes. I hear. Cry soon. <laughs> we cry. Deep brain stimulation is extraordinary. Um, you, know, you, you can't feel it. You look anesthetic, but you're awake. And they said, We're just drilling your brain, uh, skull now. Uh, pluck the membrane so you'll feel some pulling. Someone's holding your hand, the nurse, you don't know. It's really powerful. That helps. It, um, it's very powerful. It takes your life in uh, becoming a flapping. I sort of um, eat again. I couldn't, I couldn't eat because I was flapping so much. So I was very lean then. It was so good for late weight loss. In some ways, it's my marker of my um, well being. Who's mine on what we have achieved? Maybe it's like less time. And also, you have to be good because to your friends and your loved ones, you can't just moan about or to grumble about it or be um, driven mad. Just, you know, it's still life that to enjoy. Paris disease doesn't end life. But, um, bugger it. It can get a bit much sometimes, I feel. I mean, some people have pictures of glamorous women next to them and fast cars. I always have a pig's head on my arm, which, which is fine, because I don't buy pig's heads. In Singapore, I had four pigs in its shoes in it at lunchtime, because before when people wanted me to eat pigs in its stew, which is interesting because you can compare four women pigs into its stew, but quite a lot of pigs in its stew for the morning. So it's, um, yes, they're awful. An awful man or whatever. His um Don's has a burden. Don's has delicious. And this is extraordinary stuff, Paul. I mean the pig's head alone has many feasts lurking. Ears, cheeks, nose, crackling. Oh, tail. Oh, crispy tail. Fantastic. Very good. What will we uh, enjoy today? Um, well, bow marrow, quite a, a little pile of bow marrow. Set ourselves up. And then there's uh, a lovely cold middle white, which is a pig, which you get. Cold uh, pickled quince, which is yum. And uh, deep fried tripe, which uh, that was very good. Um, very proud of, which you should be because it's delicious. And some salt pollock, I think. Oh, so then, uh, not being too full because there's a pie, hair pie, and uh, that was pretty kidneys in there as well. The kidneys on the so yes, we're all right, the greens. And some mashed pie. Yeah. Yeah. They'll be okay. Yeah. They'll be all right. Sounds a feast. A yeah. feast. Yeah. I just got to show the red wine. A bit short of mentors. But, uh, well, I did have one chap, Charles Campbell, who got with me at the Globe. And he sat in the corner, smoking, drinking vodka all night. Warm. He made a soup, a chilled cucumber soup, which uh, 
put two of salt in. I need to have a proper face and put in a fag. And, fuck it, we'll call it cucumber and sea salt soup. Uh, it seems to make sense. But it was a, it was a healthy approach to food I learned from Charles. And Dad took me to have a lunch, which was um, had my first take to her. A chill bottle brewery. It was just mind blowing. Fantastic. Food on the island is um, that's quite minimal options. But the sea is the one to turn to. And the lobsters don't. They're, they're kind of sensitive creatures. They don't like to travel much. And there's something about lobsters that's been plucked out of the water. So, chopped in half. Margo and grilled for two minutes. It's um, it, it's another beast altogether. How, how does it make dishes? I'll come up with dishes. Play a blue whale, I think. One goes around one's mouth open and then plankton in, and then you sort it out and mess it. So if you digest some of it, it's stoned. Um, also, you'd look at in the cold room in the kitchen. Look in there, and you sort of you've got a different focus. You look at something a bit of lamb, a sheep, or bean, or whatever. It's some. Um, they talk to you. Maybe one side conversation, but <laughs> but I never sat at anyone's feet. I learned to go that way, so I had to follow my own weird thoughts. Which um, some say it's good and some say it's bad. But um, now it's what's happened. So, yeah. my own strange mother. So, my came up to the kitchen, and um, I think that at that point I knew I thought, oh, what a wonderful redhead, super baby. So, I asked her to come. The dodgy nightclub for whiskey in the night and like a rule in we fell in love on. I was doing sort of a <laughs> and she sort of stabbed me to shape her, which is perfect. I knew that. Um she made a chef for me. Uh, that was our four and just as well as every restaurant one become lovers. And now looking back really. It was um yeah, very heady, and much like a really later. Where we still are. Very good, very good. Well, a few weeks before St John opened, I was in the cinema, watching a Grand Booth by myself with some other weird foodie people dotted around the cinema. Um, the, the first meat delivery. And then he roasts these beautiful big bones and Philip Nye and Michelle Mastrani and they all there stuck on these bones. And this beam of light came to the cinema onto me. So there's the menu for you, dish for you. And I went home, Mo, Mo, I've got a dish. Said, do chips, do chips, he said. Little did you know what? And it was um, amazing. And it's delicious, it's extraordinary stuff, oh man. So it was born, a signature dish. Talking about head earlier, cheek, side cheek, cheek of a pig's head. Pigs like alligator in a swamp, so the cheeks sticking out get crispy. Underneath it's all getting all jelly and lovely and soft and giving. When you sit down to supper, you would offer your loved one half a pig's cheek. What's better? I mean, isn't that romantic? Okay, it reminds me of my wedding night as well. We flew to Paris. I was just my eyes and I just missed a party. So he. And she then fell asleep in her stage tower. Soft lane, luckily. And I was using pretty poor grey. So there I was by myself on my wedding night. The pig trotter, bonding out beautifully. My other fussy pen, I say, ah. So they have a special place in my heart. Pig trotter. 
Simple isn't easy. Never easy. The first thing I did in America was a charity dinner for Parkinson's. And, um, everyone would be around saying, how many components you got in your dish? And I said, well, there's two things on the plate. Which, I flummoxed all these chefs. I think he was trained his, a good thing to remember. Yes. What were the two things? Um, a braised pork belly and trotters with a mashed potato. It was jolly good. And life is um, is a kind of fragile thing. Like it's, it is, is elemental, and it's um, rock. Holds the sand in place. I'm told the sand is maca, which is green, green herbs, wildflowers. And then rock comes up here and there, the higher bits and the lower bits, but it's mainly flat. It's almost bound to the ground, so when you fall over, to a twisky, you bounce back up again. Very handy. Also, the chap of steamy nature. Uh, so nice to somewhere that has a cool wind to cool keep me so my central core down. But, um, and things taste best cooked on driftwood. Terry has plenty of, so that's, that's in the region itself really to go there. Yes, my life is, I couldn't be happier. I'm in a space I've created, total clock, in the doors, and all morning I've seen the whole thing happen, start up, fire up, engines, bread arriving. It's all just it's magical. The very good moments have been tables, you see them hover around the table of six. You go, why don't you come here? It's not very nice. There's no music, and it's all very white. And, and then they sit down, you see their faces change, they, they eat some they're eating strange things they may not have eaten before, fish and chips, whatever it is. There's other menus out there. And you see them warming up. It's, it's very, very satisfactory feeling. I want to always be educated people, but it's nice to have happiness. Glow up. Warm glow. Yes, really is a kind of restraint. But I believe in pleasure too, quite heavily. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a role, a way to give pleasure. Food. It's a huge part of the meal, but it's, there's nothing else. A great lunch. Everything's sparkling and magical, and everything flows, and, and it's, um, and you know, you've orchestrated it as a chef or a shunter, but it's, um, those moments are very hard to, you can't predict them generally, I find. You have, you have to sort of catch them, enjoy them when they're happening. It's strange because I, I cook and well, food alone can't achieve that moment. You can almost achieve it, but I think uh, there's a few other cogs that need to just be turned and tweaked and oiled. Just to uh, so then have that moment really. That, that, wow, whoa, pizzazz, yeah, kind of thing. You're on death row. What's your final meal? I've been asked similar questions. Um, I know you're allowed alcohol, but I don't think you have to make it. Oh, come on, let's say that they give you alcohol. <laughs> well, a good gin martini to start. Definitely, because you're going to hit the zone quite quickly. It's obviously a man of death. And, um, and sea urchins. And uh, sheep's milk cheese, so we have very good red burgundy. 
and chocolate ice cream and and um out of the much smoking cigarettes dancing. If a loud dancing last me a little bit, yes. Dancing and um then I think I'm about ready to get zapped or whatever. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome <coughs> Jeremy Lee, Margot Henderson, and most importantly on this occasion, Fergus Henderson. <laughs> and I think it's worthwhile at least acknowledging another presence, possibly or certainly not invited, but certainly here and that is uh, the presence of Parkinson's, which has been a companion for 30 years now. And uh, if we don't acknowledge it, I think that would be gauche. Um, so uh, TJ Wilcox made that beautiful film uh, in 2017. We're six years down the line. Lots of questions still remain. Uh, um, and I think we should attempt to fill in those gaps over the next hour or so. Um, and the one question, well, I had many, but one which really jumped out at me is, I still can't work out whether you're a stoic or a hedonist. <laughs> um, I think a hedonist. <laughs> Said with such certainty, and I, I think... <laughs> I think those of us around you who are lucky enough to be around you would agree with that wholeheartedly. But I also see lots of rigor and restraint in your life's work. Um, and I think that it's that, it's always felt to me that balance that has uh, given such a unique experience to dining at St. John or under your guise. Um, and I'd like to understand a bit of the broader picture, um, which is where Jeremy uh, comes into play and, of course, Margot. Um, and firstly, I'd like to just get a picture of... Um, I was reminded in the previous talk, uh, the brilliant Yvonne Maxwell um, mentioned and reminded me how London is a constantly changing city. Um, and I'd like to go back to... Uh, 1990 to 1994 and just take a look at what London was like culinarily at that point. Um, uh, Jeremy. Oh, gosh. It, what a time it was. Um, I think we were in the absolute grip by then and the surfboard was coming up on the big wave of this extraordinary new realm of restaurants that was opening up. And the great grandees like the Gavroche and Tom Clare, headed up by Coffin and the Roof Cat family, um, held complete sway over everything, along with Anton Mossman of the Dorchester and what have you. But there was a new um, spirit coming in, um, and it was first brought under the name of modern European cookery, uh, which was being practiced primarily by the likes of Alistair Little and Roly Lee and Simon Hopkinson. Um, amazingly, none of those three ever got Michelin stars. And this is very significant because suddenly there was a belt of restaurants that fell under the palm of the Good Food Guide rather than the Michelin Guide. And under the very gentle guiding light, under not such a gentle person of Tom Jane, he sort of fashioned this amazing realm. And along with chefs beginning to emerge, producers began to emerge. And with the producers, we began access to ingredients we'd never had before. So suddenly, Italian dishes that we could only enjoy in Italy or fantasize about, we suddenly could start playing with. Um, and so modern European cookery became the order of the day, and de rigueur. And then bit by bit through this, and it's still not very clear how, where, and what, and why, and when, but British cookery began to emerge, which had never, ever had any play on the great scheme of things at all, ever. And suddenly, in the midst of it all, Fergus started cooking. 
um, in its pop-ups. Um, and we've never seen anything like this at all either, because you know there we were doing steak and kidney puddings and fish and chips and thinking this was great British tuck. Fergus comes in and polonks a carrot on a plate with a soft-boiled egg and a bowl of aioli and goes, there you go. And brought the house down. You know, the, the critics, while not even divided, unanimous in their joy of this, customers could not understand it at all. And so this extraordinary revolution, you know, and I hate that word because it sounds so violent, but it really was, you know, a real wake-up call and a shake-up to what was going on. And not only was there um, extraordinary produce being very simply and beautifully prepared, as Fergus said, doing simple, sorry about that, doing simple ain't easy. It takes enormous confidence and courage to do it and to start have the conviction to continue with it. You know, as Margaret Wise is saying, oh, keep on, get some chips in there quick. You know, and prior, as I said, you're going, no, chips only ever appeared with a dish. So maybe like skate knobs or longlistine. No, never with longlistine. You had to ask very carefully for the chips with the longlistine. <laughs> By the way, and sometimes we did give it to you. as an aside, um, uh, I sometimes find myself running to work in the morning. And part of that reason is because uh, uh, I work under the same roof as Jeremy. Um, and relevantly, uh, on the chip point... <laughs> <laughs> We've got an ongoing battle uh, of Jeremy <laughs> desperately trying to remove the chip from the menu and the forces of the tsunami of, uh, of Quo Vadis insisting that they remain. So uh, the chip controversy remains strong. But going back 30 years. Well, Arnold Wesco did it very well. He wrote a trilogy of plays on the subject called Everything with Chips. Which pretty much, and he was a died in the world communist. So I think that sums it all up. <laughs> and, and I think we know where you stand on the chip. Or almost certainly you actually stand on the chip and <laughs> it gets nowhere near the plate. No, quite as rough as that with chips. <laughs> um, you like a chip. Yeah. Yeah, I like a chip. The reason I said that, though, there was a backstory. It was, <laughs> there was St John had opened and there'd been a lot of reviews about awfully good and awful this and, and it was very hot and there was no... Um, Aircon in St. John, and we were a bit like, where is everyone? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is going to happen? And we were a bit nervous. So my, it was sort of my joke, get the bone marrow off, put some chips on, and maybe they'll come. I mean... So it, it, it wasn't <laughs> quite, like, in the beginning. It's an anxiety <laughs> that lasts was, to this was, day. Yeah. <laughs> um, but stepping back to then, uh, um, Margot, you uh, appeared in Fergus's orbit when? So I was working at the uh, at Eagle, and um, Fergus and his sister came for lunch. I'd met him a year before, but they came for lunch at the Eagle, and we got talking, and then I said to his sister that we, we should open a restaurant together. He called that night and said, why haven't we thought of it before? <laughs> and we literally decided there and then. But when I started cooking, I mean, the, London was a lot darker, and there wasn't much around, and there were less restaurants, and you went to Soho f to go to restaurants, there wasn't all the restaurants in the suburbs so much. And, um, you know, we put on the menu quails and I instantly started boning them out. And he said, no, we're going to cook them whole. And I was like, of course. And I, I you know, it was a quite a revelation for me. And I started doing the <laughs> sprigs of parsley and almost a, a jus. And, you know, he knocked all that out of me, the jus and the <laughs> sprigs of parsley. And it was, um, it was so exciting, and it all felt like it was just completely making sense. And I learned to cook in a different way. Not that the other way had been bad. It was, you know, we did lots of good things, but this was just, it all seemed to make much more sense to me. And I feel that this is, um, uh, whilst it's undoubtedly a celebration of your magnificence, I think it would be... Uh, appalling to um, not recognise the intertwining of, of your influence and uh, how um, you and he have worked together and co-created together. Um, there was... Let's have a round of applause for that. <laughs> Famously bad at taking a compliment. <laughs> Well, That's vodka in there, rich. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I remember my earliest experience of, I think it was both of your food, and this is, this is illustrative of the fact that it s became so intertwined, was uh, after a particularly devastating breakup 
um, I repaired to the French house uh, and was presented with a huge plate of piglet's tails. Um, and uh, it remains one of the most memorable and extraordinary meals of my life. Would that have been in about 1991, two? Three. Yeah. Three? We started there, three. Yeah. Um, and I... Or two. Yeah, 92, yeah. I don't remember that food existing in London before, and I'm, I'm interested that you who were making that food and you who were so ingrained in the scene, and of course, Jeremy, if there was, um, you know, the French classics were ruling the roost to a certain extent, and I'm interested about the, the sheer gutsiness that it required to put such a new form or such a new expression of food before people, how was it? How was it received um, uh, by the public? Well, I initially? think one of the great things that Fergus brought to the restaurant um, world was this fearlessness, this absolute assurance that what he was doing was right, and loved it. And there is a great line. Anna Winter says it very well: "Never look left, never look right, always look forward, never look at what anyone else is doing." And not that Fergus did that. All Margaret did that. Objectively, but they did, they did their thing. And this was most unusual. Most folk were very reticent, very quiet. You know, most people would sit around a table and go, well, oh, look, they're doing that, and that's great. We could do a bit of this and take a bit of that. And so they would cherry pick what worked in other places. And with St. John, it was absolutely not. You know, it was whitewashed walls and no um, art, which is bizarre considering a great chunk of their lines is art, and some of their best friends are artists. Um, but for them, really, the baubles on the tree were the customers, you know, and the wine, the bottles of wine, and the, and the loaves of bread, you know, the whole fanfare that you arrived to to sit in St. John really did blow everyone away. And the fact that it was in an old smokehouse right by Smithfields as well, which was another area, that, you know, another market in peril in central London. And markets are vital for the, they're a main art, they're a major, you know, heartbeat of a, of a community. And so St. John ignited something in Clark and Well, which, you know, was somewhere you'd simply got the bus through or a taxi through to go somewhere else. And suddenly there was reason to slam on the brakes and just go, ah, Welsh rabbit, you know, bone marrow, um, and enjoy these things and almost it with cold brie. And this was, no, this was quite a normal thing to do there. It wasn't, you know, um, grandstanding or being otherworldly. It was just the order of the day. And this, this really was revolutionary and set, of course, um, on the trajectory of which they're still enjoying to this day, which is, you know, hats off, darling. Well done. Very much so. Um, and whilst this new presentation of food was garnering so much attention and loyalty, um, at the same time there were uh, brigades in the kitchen who were uh, being inspired, who were working under Fergus were being um, exposed to his creativity. Uh, James Lowe, uh, Tom Pemberton, um, and we're lucky enough uh, to have a couple of those here tonight. Um, and uh, it would be intriguing to hear the experience from their point of view. So please could you welcome Ravneet Gill and Lee Tiernan. Lee outdressing the entire room. Well, I dressed down. I didn't want to show Fergus up. You know. <laughs> I mean, you just you just do you, um, which may well have been. I, I'm intrigued to know. So you worked uh, under under Fergus from 2003 until 2013. That's a a big stint by anyone's means. Yes, a decade. Um, and it's almost certainly unheard of uh, today. Um, it was a baby when he started. <laughs> well, I was 24, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and what so made you old? Well, as an ancient 24-year-old. Yeah. I had read a passage in a book by Anthony Bourdain called Fire Over London, and he describes going into St. John Kitchen and having a conversation with Fergus and... Fergus has this pig he's presented him with and describes it as a noble animal. And 
I really like cooking. It's the first thing that really clicked. And I'd been told I was, I felt good at it. I felt like I could actually, uh, I could actually do it and do it well and enjoy doing it. So I wanted to latch on to that. And I knew I didn't want to work for someone who was going to shout at me. I don't, I've never thought humiliation is the best thing to do. And I felt after I read that passage that Fergus was someone I could work for. And I had not never met him. And I phoned up and I'd taken out his advice and not called up during service. <laughs> uh, so I called around 4.30 and it just happened that Ed Lewis, the head chef at the time, was walking past the phone because the phone was in the dining room at that time. Next to a big plinth, this huge book with all his names scribbled on it and lines through it and stuff. So he's picked up the phone. I've asked if I could come and work for free for two weeks and... He was like, yeah, sure, no worries, just, just turn up now, blah, 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 blah. Did you but have cooking experience? Again? I'd, I'd worked in, on an island called St. John mm. as a sort of dropping conch fritters into a deep fryer and washing up and running around and, and so on. But up until that, I'd just done a, a little stint at culinary school. And I don't think there was a better education a young, young I'll call myself young, at 24, could, could have had. It was... A remarkable education in food. Um, Fergus talks about having a conversation with a pig. Listen to what it's saying, to, or listen to what it's telling you, and what to do with it. You break it all apart, and you use this bit for that, and that bit for this. And, but make sure you're in a good mood, because otherwise the the ingredients will misbehave. <laughs> so it it wasn't uh, the environment at Saint John. I think you'd agree, Rab. It was always very calm, lots of mutual respect. No one, was, no one shouted at me once when I was working. In That's the 10 years of no shouting. 10 years. And it demonstrated that you know, a different approach can, can yield good results. And I certainly appreciated that. And the patience I was shown, the amount of times I messed things up was, uh, was remarkable. <laughs> and from messing things up occasionally come great things. Sometimes. No. <laughs> 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 I had to maybe do a crash course in fixing Hobart's uh, <laughs> mixing machines. And Rav, you um, were there from 2015 for some years. Um, what were you cooking before and what changed uh, after working under the auspices of Fergus? Well, quite differently to Lee, I had never heard about St. John and I was working sort of Michelin background, really wanting to hone in in a pastry background on my mirror glazing and making things that were really perfect. I had worked at Zuma, Harvey Nichols and a private members club and it also aspiring to be in a chocolatier, learning how to make you know, beautiful truffles and things like that. And I went to St John because I really needed a job because I was applying to grad schemes to get out of food because I realised that I didn't really like the environment very much but I'd do it on the side. And I got there, went for an interview and then immediately like, fell in love with it. I had never worked somewhere where people spoke to you with respect. You would sit and have a break every day. I couldn't believe it. And everyone was communicating nicely. There was all this food that I'd never heard of before. But I was quite confused because I wanted to use... I was like, why, why can't we use mango puree? Why can't we use <laughs> praline paste? I just didn't understand it. And where are the silicone moulds? Because I want to make an entremet. And then sort of slowly... I. I it all, I sort of undid all of that learning and became a much better chef because of it. Mm. Yeah, it feels also, thinking of some of the alumni who we've mentioned, that all have gone on to be very much their own people. They're, they're not working to a template, which sometimes you see from uh, cooks who come from uh, well-known kitchens. Um, I think St. John, it, it teaches you. Nice one. <laughs> it teaches you to sing with your own voice yes. and that's really important and I don't know if you really realise that when you start, when I started at St John I just wanted to get it right but it does, it forms you and moulds you in, in, in the best possible ways Yeah and Rav you are um, is it fair to call you an activist as well as a cook and a broadcaster I feel like people have started using that label, so I'll go with it. Okay. Um, well, as long as it doesn't cause offence or isn't false, but um, I feel that there's um, there 
from what you both say about it being a very kind and listening kitchen. Although, um, you know, where we live in an age where people get offended by the colour of people's T-shirts, it still feels like uh, it was a firm place to work and the education was very sincere. Um, but I'm only looking out in. Was it like that? How was it? What, the environment, the yeah. working environment? Yeah, yeah. It was always very civil and mm. patient. And there was just an underlining philosophy everyone was working towards. I think famously, Tre uh, Fergus has said, if you're going to eat an animal, it's only polite to eat the whole thing. Yes. And politeness just runs through, ran through that kitchen. Fergus, how do you feel when you see your uh, former charges go off and do such magnificent things? It's very kind of... That's lovely. Yeah. It's, um... It's very bonny. Yeah. Yeah, I'd echo that all day long. Um, Didn't you uh, want to say it's like a, a mother hen? No, you won't. That's a... Buzzing around. It's, um... Uh, mother hen and her chickadees. <laughs> I'm seeing you now with feathers. It's really doing my head. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, I'll just get that image out of my head. Still wildly attractive, though. And a, another I, thing I learned at oh. St. John was uh, the importance of a good lunch. Yes. That's definitely something yeah. I haven't forgotten. <laughs> yeah. And I think once you've seen it demonstrated that kitchens can work harmoniously and people can be nice to each other and you don't feel sad every day, I then went on to every other job being like, there is a place that exists that does this. And I would preach it so much because I had never seen it before. And that's why I set up Counter Talk. And that's why ever, ever since St. John, I didn't want to go to another restaurant that, was, that treated you badly. But really foolishly, there were silly places that still did it. And I just couldn't understand it. Whereas I just think it demonstrated kindness effortlessly. And I went to work for Lee for a while. And again, it was kind and lovely. Yeah, <laughs> full of creativity. Um, and indeed, I can vouch that your kitchen is very kind, and <laughs> I imagine Mark... Mine's is a night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just screaming the whole time. <laughs> no, it's but had, the, had the three of you worked in very shouty kitchens previously? Actually, I did. Oh, he worked for Simon Hopkinson. Well, oh, um, God. <laughs> No, interesting. I think one. I think there, there definitely was a nutty culture that harked back to a time when, you know, chefs were working insane, ridiculous hours and every weekend and never having time out. And when they were, when they did have time off, they went completely berserk, and so they were exhausted. I mean, no wonder they were, They lost their rag. It's a stressful you know, job, though. It's, it's a, a very stressful pressure. job, but it did make for a very stressful environment. But I did luck out not working in kitchens where you had to dress everyone as chefs. You know, I mean, there, there was a time when, you know, when anyone walked through a kitchen, you know, if even if it was the managing director, they'd just get called chef. You know, because nobody ever knew what, who's, what names were and what people were called. You know, and there was this, this bizarre culture. Um, and it was all about taking the carrot and turning it into these minute little dice and, you know, tweezers here, little flour there, and all this little blips and blobs and things. You know, That's so, what's happening now as well. Well, Maybe you know, these things are cyclical. I know. It's like the seasons, dear. Back yeah. they come with the tedious inevitability that you can't understand. He's off. But you had always known that you'd wanted to be a uh, chef. Um, Fergus, you trained as an architect, and cooking came to supplement your studies. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure it was as quite as planned as Ben thought it was a good. Um, um, you were studying as an architect. All his buildings were about eating halls and uh, yes. eating food. And then he worked in an architect's office, but he didn't like it because he only had sandwiches and cups of tea <laughs> at the time. I don't understand why people with lunch would go out and. Uh, this architect's drawing board and had a sandwich and a tin of Coca Cola. <laughs> and uh, so that was meant to revive you in midday. Yeah. <laughs> it was, um, so. Yeah, the office wasn't quite where you wanted to be. No. 
<laughs> but I, I think it's fair. Um, I remember during the pandemic, um, uh, you were in hospital with COVID, and I remember reading that Margot's principal role, as well as lots of love and affection, was to smuggle in sandwiches at all points. Uh, I did smuggle in quite a few sandwiches, but they all came back, actually. Oh, so they were untouched, <laughs> yeah, sticking no, to I your think, guns there. I think they were a bit like, well, what do we do with them? But <laughs> obviously, he lost a bit of weight. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was trying to get them into them. Yes. Um, I... Uh, I think it's worth going back to 1994 and when this magnificent restaurant opened um, and it was uh, modern, very new in all senses of the words. Um, you've highlighted the fact that there were no pictures on the walls. There was obviously no soundtrack other than the clatter of knives and forks. Uh, the food, we uh, have come to know and love it. But it was, and it was embraced by uh, um, an almost, um, uh, it was embraced feverishly by a new audience. Um, uh, and there was a cross section of the emerging British art scene who frequented um, St. John uh, regularly. Um, and it would be great to hear a little more about that scene and uh, why it was adopted with such aplomb. Um, and I'd love to invite uh, Sadie Coles and her longtime business partner, Pauline Daly, to the stage. That's, a, that's an artistic decision. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, you were there. <laughs> I wasn't. I really want to know about it. And why did you fall so strongly for this place and, and indeed, Fergus? Um, well, we were led there by artists, actually, because um, um, Angus Fairhurst and Sarah Lucas had a studio on Clerkenwell Road, and I think it was Angus who possibly was the first person through the door at St. John. And um, very, very quickly, I think, think they were all having <coughs> lunch and dinner there sort of practically every day. And we heard about it and were taken and it was immediately so different and so exciting and so rigorous and authentic that the whole uh, group of people that we were involved in, with all went all the time with great enthusiasm. <laughs> Into the night, as the nights wore on Yeah, and on. so we would often end up, uh, when service ended, um, back in Soho, where um, Margot and Fergus lived, um, usually in the Groucho Club, um, until very late. So there was a lot of kind of ex um, outside the restaurant stuff that was going on, as well as um, enjoying the food of St. John. What was it um, about the restaurant itself and the space that appealed to you so much? Well, it was mainly the food, really. Thank God for a restaurant. <laughs> um, yeah. But it was flexible. I mean, yeah. you could, uh, you know, very, very quickly, all the galleries, and at, th at that time, there weren't that many galleries either. There, there, it's, like, now there are hundreds of galleries, but there, there weren't that many. But very, very quickly, all the galleries um, who were showing artists of our generation were, were doing their parties at St. John. And um, uh, St. John were very accommodating. You could have... Um, um, Welsh rarebit and uh, wine in the bar as your party if you had less money or less reason to celebrate or you could have the whole joint uh, which we did on several occasions I think probably for Sarah's um, sh uh, exhibition The Law which was in an empty um, warehouse building on St John Street um, but certainly after um, maybe a Tate show, we had a big party where there were no tables, they were just pushed against the wall, which was a little bit um, unusual for um, Fergus to let us do that. And um, we had roast uh, suckling pig yeah. and in buns, and then lots of dancing, 
lots of uh, drinking and just everybody was just sliding all over the floor on the pig fat <laughs> after a while. And then lots of people dancing on the bar, particularly these two. <laughs> Margot and Pauline were legendary for getting on the bar and dancing. So, but, but that it wasn't just my gallery who was doing this, it was every gallery. I also think it's interesting that artists had enjoyed it so much. It was the, and there is no art that's boring or very exhausting. <laughs> and if you think, I think they're actually quite find it relaxing. Yeah, because <laughs> it's not one particular artist. Is it? The, the author yeah. has no artist, so yeah. it's really. But I think it was. Yeah, it was also the authentic authenticity of of Fergus's food. You know, like that. I think artists are very interested in how. People put things together, like um, and and the the pared down uh, nature of the food and the um, the uh, truth to materials, which is something that artists think about all the time, was so obvious that it. That I think it uh, artists found it very inspiring. I would also say that Fergus educated uh, <laughs> certainly me, but possibly a few others um, in our circle, in, not just in food, but in wine, in the way to treat people, the outfits. I'm very inspired by Fergus's clothes. But uh, almost everything. That, like, if, if there's one, if, uh, if you want to know how to do something properly, ask Fergus. Well, this is a common thread that begins to emerge from these conversations. Um, and uh, I'd love to clear up a, a rumor that I've heard. And it was told to me by um, <clears throat> a, uh, a good and well respected journalist who said that at one of these parties, um, full of artists, Banksy appeared. Um, and the only relevance of that was the next day, you walked in and there was a sort of, I don't know, a rat sweeping something under the kind of curtainy thing that he'd drawn onto it. And Fergus's immediate reaction was to order it to be painted over. <laughs> Fergus? <laughs> Is this true? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it. <laughs> Thank God, by the way, that would have been a disaster if it was from my imagination. Thank you. <laughs> um, but it, it was kind of it was kind of wild in there. But I think it was a very different time. It certainly felt like a more hedonistic, uh, more creative moment in London. Do you think that's fair to say? I, do. I, think, I think the great thing that Ferg and Margot brought to the restaurant scene was they're adventurers. And it was always an adventure, and it was always fun. <clears throat> and that was expressed in the menu and in the service in the way that, you know, you would, if, if, as you were saying, if it was a table of four or a table of two or a table that ran the length of the dining room, it was this fantastic show, just this parade of waiters bringing these great dishes and plonking them down. You know, and then with a you know big pile of plates, and then who was going to be mother, and then cutlery being handed around. It was done with such style and aplomb, and panache um, that it just blew you away completely. And I think that's something we all cherish and hold very dear. You know, and Lang may it's Lumbreek, I say, because uh, not many places could do that. You know, in the brilliant way the dining room was laid out, you could do it in the bar or in the dining room or take the whole place. You know, it was extraordinarily. Um, amenable to being all things to all people at all times. It's a very, it's a very robust building. Yeah. <laughs> it was, after all, a bacon smoking house, and it's had many sort of faces, hasn't it? And it, you know, you could bring your kids in as well, and they could muck about, and that, you know, it wasn't. It could stand up to all this. There have been raves. <laughs> Oh, there had been raves before it was St. John, yes. and it had been a squat, and so it's, you know, it's a good building for having a lot going on. Well, also in terms of artist, artists' haunts, um, I'm thinking of uh, another um, legendary one uh, that was very much in action at that point that couldn't be more different, that was the colony rooms. Um, and... Uh, uh, the excess no was food. much more over... Just drinking. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But um, the, the difference in uh, the fact that artists gravitated towards each and yet had a, a deeply different experience, um, it rather felt like, in a way, St John became a canvas 
for you to project your experience onto. Does that chime true? I, I, just, I, just, I just know that every time we had a dinner there, it made us look good. <laughs> it really did and the, the, it, it was almost like a virus like you you know we would have somebody from uh, an artist from New York showing and we would have our dinner at St John and Margot and Fergus would make everybody feel so welcome and so relaxed and have the best time best London weekend they'd ever had in, the, in ever and that that would just that just began to spread across the art world like everybody knew this was the place to be and then, and then it, people began to ask you to do... And I think the sharing platters mm -hmm. and things like that, mm -hmm. the feasting, because uh, St John was the beginning, uh, I think it was one of the f first mm. places where, you know, you'd get a whole fish and, um, or a shoulder of lamb and you'd all serve it and share it. And that was very exciting and it felt, it's, that felt quite um, new as well for uh, big events, mm. big happy groups of people. Um, and, and gallery dinners tend to be quite stuffy things with a piece of dried old sea bass and a, uh, you know, <laughs> so it was actually a revelation to have a delicious meal in, in, and St. John was relaxing, you know, partly because you didn't have art on the wall and lots of sort of ridiculous, pretentious um, stuff around the meal. I think everybody just felt relaxed. And of course, the kitchen was so close to the action as well. It felt very much like uh, there was a, you know, the, the, the cooking, the eating, the experience was very much intermingled. Did you feel part of what was going on outside of the path? Yeah, definitely were nights where I would, could feed off the energy that's happening in the dining room and the murmur of everyone having different conversations. It's, it's an incredible sound. Yeah, a great place for late nights. Now, we, um, you know, we witness a, a, a creative force. It had an effect on an immediate audience, but there's no doubt that St. John had an effect on uh, the eating public, um, restaurants in general, a generation of cooks. Um, and I think it would be really valuable to uh, hear a little from a, a, a critic's point of view those who observe and write about what was going on. So without further ado, please could you welcome uh, jazz musician, broadcaster, um, and sometime writer, Jay Rayner. Right, so what's my job? <laughs> your job is to talk to us about your perception of what it did to what St. John did for a wider dining public. I think the key thing, to put it into some sort of context, is restaurants in the broad sense around London were quite a novelty. And they came with a lot of accessories, a lot of glamour, a lot of stuff around tablecloths, and look what they've done to the interior. I'm talking about places like the Atlantic Bar and Grill, um, Oliver Payton's place on Piccadilly Circus, now actually Brasserie is Adele. Um, these grand places, Quaglinos and all of that. And then Fergus and Margot, they open St. John, and it's a white room. And instead of being able to focus on the decor and a stool for the handbag and things like that, you focus on the plate. And it was that which was, just look at this food. It's not like there wasn't anybody who, who'd, who'd done that, sort of created great food. There was lots of great food in London, but it was of a different kind. But what St. John did was said, Here's some food on a plate. Plated often, and I've said this to you, Fergus, in a very Italian sort of way, which is, here's just a couple of things on a plate, as you said in the film, you know, how many items are there on your plate? Just two. Um, and it, it cut away from the ephemera. And I know a lot of people found that really baffling at first. We know now that St. John is a, an institution and a much lauded one, and rightly so. But it's fair to say, right at the beginning, it wasn't a massive hit from day one, was it? There were moments when it wasn't, you were thinking, are they gonna come? Which is why we were talking about the chips on the plate. Um, but it was very much and very quickly one that was picked up by chefs elsewhere, by restaurants elsewhere. I'm fortunate to travel. And I've been in restaurants in Chicago, Publican, uh, Animal on Fairfax in LA, you can see it in Paris. And it's not clear whether the people who are feeding you have ever been to St. John, but they've definitely read the book. 
um, and they've picked up the ethos and bits of it appear here and there. And I can't honestly think of a single restaurant which has had the impact of St. John on other restaurants in that way. Um, and that's a remarkable thing. Here, here. Um, I think it, when we were talking uh, a few weeks ago, I think we need to acknowledge the book as well, which was published in 2004. And as you've just pointed out, um, uh, you said to me, I know cooks in Australia who were thinking of giving up cooking um, prior to reading that book, and that set them on the path till today. It, it is a profound and important book, and unique as well. Yeah, one of the interesting things is, again, am I right, the original book didn't massively do, but it was when it was put together with the, the second book and republished by well, Bloomsbury. They weren't, they weren't going to reprint it. And yeah. Fergus said, no way. Yeah. Not stepping for this. So he went off and got a new publisher. And, and, and that's did the one it, that has become massive and is everywhere. And, you know, when I, when I wrote a piece about Nose to Tail, I was phoning chefs up in various parts of the world saying, have you got this? I went, oh, yeah. We've got three copies because various people want to want to <coughs> hold on to them. And that book is... <sighs> I don't want to get quasi-religious about this, Fergus. No. But the Gospel of St. John. <laughs> well, it is a little Bible, isn't it? It is. It is. It's all there. And it's also it's written in such a charming voice. It's written in your voice. I mean, the line about, I, think, I, I can't remember if it was, I think it was for Deep Fried Rabbit, where you say something along the lines of, get a young, tender one. <laughs> and, People being very upset about that, which was marvellous. I think, I think we should also recognise the photography of Jason Lowe in that book, which was absolutely extraordinary. And it's a great book, and I go back to it often, and clearly all of us around this... But they didn't book. like the photography in the first book, which we all love, and the pictures were all taken in our kitchen from above with all of us eating all the dishes and just hands on them, no, no face. to be one time or ahead of the time, I'm not sure, but anyway, people have got more used to it, and that, that sort of photography is now used quite a lot, if you see it, but then the humour in the other books, like the, uh, what is it, the chefs running through the, um, there's a lot of humour in the books, which brings the recipes to life as well, so there's a lot of joy in it, really. Well, it just shows the value of standing firm, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> I'm interested in how the critics first received St. John because it was, it, it, it was new. It was. Um, I can only talk from my, my, my side. My first experience of it was in the late 90s. I was part of a discussion board called E. Gullet. I don't know if anybody in the room remembers E. Gullet. It was where, a little bit like your food pervs at that screening of Le Grand Bouff, we would gather... Um, and there were some people like Tim Haywood was still in advertising, but he was posting on there. Marina O'Loughlin was in there and a lot of other people. And as well as sharing our experience of restaurants, w we started holding get togethers. We actually met in real life. And the first one was a feast at St. John where 18 people who had nothing in common apart from appetite <laughs> gathered to eat a lot of bone marrow, a whole suckling pig, a mussel salad, it was outrageous and fantastic. <laughs> that was my first experience. So, uh, because I didn't, start, I didn't start writing about food until later, uh, until 99. And by that time, Jonathan Meads had already been in and Matthew Fort had already been in, and I didn't think it was one for me. But I eventually did write about it in 2001 because there was so much to write about. Our job is not just to say, well, the cooking of this is, well, that's overdone. It, it's to find a story, and St. John is always a story. It's just dying to be written about. Yeah, by now, it's, it's, it, at this point, even in 2001, it, it's, an, it's an institution, it's well-frequented, it's utterly beloved. Um, and at the same time, it's had to uh, not even fight for its own identity. It's just formed its own identity because that's what it was. And those, that identity has replicated in uh, um, St. John Bread and Wine and now uh, St. John in Marlebone. Each has its own feeling in there. Uh, 
personally, I come back to the original every time, and I'm secretly thinking of the Madelines that I'm going to uh, round it off with. But everyone has their own tale of going to St. John. Um, uh, I spent many years in Mexico. We brought you to Mexico, and you made uh, an equally profound impression on those who ate your food there. Um, and I know many chefs who the first place that they want to come to in London is uh, uh, St. John. And it kind of feels like it's going to remain that way for many years. Um, I'm so glad it can't be imitated um, effectively because there really will only be one St. John. That's how I feel. Does anyone else chime with that? I don't know, they're probably going to roll it out. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> There's a family, though. I mean, one, one of the lovely things is the di what I'd call the diaspora. If you think of the Anchor and Hope, um, to a certain degree, Tom Norrington Davis, Great Queen Street, uh, the Canton Arms, these places that you very much, the Hereford Road, you very much feel uh, are, you know, I'm now painting you as leader of a cult basically, <laughs> Fergus. But, you know, they're devotees. They're doing things in their own way, but you can feel the thumbprints of St. John all over them. True. Um, we, I believe, have a little time to take some questions. Um, and since there's such an array of characters, feel free to address uh, who you're asking the question to, if indeed there are any questions. Oh, yes, a microphone is coming to you. Yeah. Um, what's the point of haute cuisine and fine, I think fine dining is not a very fashionable word now, but just fiddly, tiny little squares and diamonds of food with tiny little dots and blobs? Because it's still really prevalent everywhere, all over the world, but I still can't quite get my head around what the point is of it. And why aren't there more restaurants like St. John? It's about delicious food. People do it really well. I love fine dining. <laughs> I love having hundreds of waiters around me and glamour. And some people don't do it so well, and some people do it. It's like going to the opera, and it's a great joy. So, I mean, you know, restaurants have so many different ways to be, and St. John is definitely not that one. But um, I just think there's even there's just so much great food going on, and especially in Br Britain at the moment. And some of it is fine dining. But you need to invest in your time into that sort of thing. It's a different way of eating. Fergus, what's the point of fine dining? Well, a few points. It's, um, I think like Mario said, there is lots of good food around. And um, it's... We do it our way, and then um, sort of others do it their way. Yeah, and that's to be enjoyed. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, those are the best well, what answers. What do you think? <laughs> I, mean, I totally agree with you. Fine, Fane Daining, spelled F-A-I-N-E, Daining, D-A-I-N-E, is only really annoying when it's done badly. Um, and when it's done well, it can be absolutely magnificent. And there is space for everything. I mean, the joy that we have now in 2023 is that there is so much more than there was. And so I remember Marcus Waring once saying to me, all I've got to do is find 60 people in a city of 9 million to eat my food. <laughs> 60 people a night. And that point is very well made. There's space even allowing for you know, cost of living crisis and all of that stuff in normal times. There is space for lots of different things. And if it's not for you, for God's sake, don't do it. Can Step I away from that. Yeah, it wasn't relaxed at all, was it? Where it's more of a convivial, atmospheric, where these 
There are quite a lot. Yeah, I, I, I can quite a lot. Just don't go back to Marcus Waring's. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not doing it for you. I also think fine dining needed St John because I think it was going it was going badly. I think food was having it really was struggling for a bit, and then St John sort of corrected it, and then now we've got all this new, quite glamorous food coming out, and all sorts of things have come out of this rather doer time that folk is sort of started. I'm not sure Noma in Copenhagen would really have existed without St. John. Yes! Wow. Hear that? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here for that comment. <laughs> Even if it's not true, it's a great line. <laughs> Did you hear that, Rene? <laughs> Maybe he's watching online. Yeah. Who else? And by the way, if there's a question, it's got. I've just had a, a note that says they have to talk into the microphone. It's being live streamed to many millions of people. There's a gentleman there in the white. Yeah. Okay, this is into the microphone. Okay. Yeah, I feel like I can hear myself. Um, I think. Uh, St. John, obviously, and um, I'm going to say for me as well, Rochelle Canteen, which I think a lot of people probably agree with, like started an obsession for a lot of people with food, how it can be done, just like the interest of different ingredients and especially nose to tail cuisine. And I'd be interested if um, Virgo, uh, Fergus and Margot, if you could like, I created a couple named there, didn't I? Um, <laughs> talk about whether you had a St. John with other restaurants in London at the time and a uh, kind of happy memory of going to a place for the first time and experiencing something new and how that inspired uh, where you are today and what you did with St. John. What restaurants influenced you, Fergus? The Bendham? Mm. <laughs> Simon? <laughs> Akita. Okay, yeah. Simon was a huge influence in us. When we started at the French house, we had roast chicken next to us the whole time. Actually, I think most of the food in the French house was out of roast chicken and other stories. And we'd always think, can we afford it? Can we afford it? And we'd trot off to the Bendham. We loved that, didn't we? <laughs> but restaurants that you... Sweetings. S sweetings. Uh, <laughs> your, face. So. your dad was the architect for the Bendham as well. Great pass for talent. He was. He was. But Sweetings is a, a restaurant that has definitely influenced Fergus. Um, he's absolutely. You love it. Don't, he writes about it in his book. Uh, he told me a story once about the scampi when you cut it in half and both sides of the scampi just disappear off the plate. <laughs> <laughs> it cried for so long. <laughs> it's got its charm, you can console yourself with a, with a tankard of Guinness and champagne like a black velvet, so nothing's ever a problem when you go to You don't go for the food, but nothing's ever a problem, it's always great. I actually unearthed your, um, your list of uh, most important books, uh, and there's some very good Fergus commentary on them, so if you'll allow me. Taste of France, uh, Robert Fresson. The best food pornography. The pictures of podgy farmers in Normandy and French cheeses gets you hot under the collar. <laughs> this is important. Uh, Marcella Hazan, the classic Italian cookbook. It works, interestingly, for someone aspiring to be a British chef. I've found this to be the most useful of books. The Cooking of Southwest France by Paula Wolfert. A book that concentrates on duck fat, prunes and pork has to be good. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to go over to Memories of Gascony by Pierre Kaufman. More duck fat, yum. <laughs> and importantly, Ma Gastronomie by Fernand Point. You've got to love a chef who shared a magnum of champagne with his barber every morning. <laughs> And his writing on food is timeless. I mean, now I know where to go. <laughs> and to get my hair cut. This morning was a magnum of champagne, and I thought, it's a good way to go. Yeah, definitely. 
Uh, any more questions? It's like count that the price is right that when they're running down the stairs. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, it's quite a practical question. But first, thank you so much for such an amazing session. It's been such an honour to hear all of your stories and your different vantage points. I just wondered where we can access the film to like refer it to other people. Um, it actually belongs to, um, is in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery. Uh -huh. So I don't know if you can go online and find it there, but okay. otherwise, Sadie yeah. Coles HQ. Amazing, yeah. thank you so much. It's yeah. beautiful. TJ, we work with, we show. Okay, so. brilliant, be in touch, thank you. <laughs> Any last questions? Mm -hmm. It's a wrap. <laughs> In that case, I think we should um, warmly applaud Fergus for such a brilliant...